before you know it. I could be back with Bellamy, Clark, and Maddie. And Murphy? Him too. Now, there was a time when movies and TV shows were content with the basic main protagonist who would reform the villain and save the day, but that time has passed. I'm not saying that everybody's become Kratos from God of War, but it is a lot of times about the quote-unquote hero who mainly values themselves and their primary friends. This concept was made popular with AMC's The Walking Dead, which at that point was mostly about walking, but it did bring attention to that kind of main character who would do bad things that were supposedly justified. Now let's forget about that for a moment and consider today's society, a society in which women are primarily placed front and center even if it doesn't benefit the initial product. I mean, look at Fleetwood Mac. They fired Buckingham because the female, whose name will not be mentioned in this video, said so, even though he's the guitarist and without him the band is practically fucked, as proven with albums like Behind the Mask and Time. What the hell was that shit? Why did it happen? It was 2018. But yeah, if you examine the movie and TV industry these days, you'll see a pretty heavy emphasis on this, even though it almost always fails. Because you can't write a good character if you're just doing it for political reasons. And most people now are smart enough to see through this. However, if you're a writer who actually wants a female lead, then that's perfectly alright. And that's what they did with the CW series The Hundred. Which was a decent show, definitely not perfect, but it handled the female lead okay, and actually avoided cancellation. Unlike Manifest, that got cancelled for a Law & Order series that was dropped by the creator. Well, I guess they fucked up. But unfortunately, one of the main problems with The Hundred is the aforementioned topic of the main protagonist. Or in this case, multiple protagonists doing unspeakable things. Like forcing people into a human-sized microwave, which previously failed and would have failed again, but it was essentially for the fate of mankind. Which is what they try to sell this as, but in actuality, it's just the test they wanted to do. You know, to be safe. At her expense. And what's funny about this is as soon as Clark, the main character, offers to do it instead, Abby, her mother, has a bit of a mind change and destroys the entire machine because apparently she had a vision that shows it would have ended badly. That she conveniently forgot to mention. Isn't that convenient? Now, here's the interesting part. You see that guy? That's John Murphy. Easily the show's best character, and lover of Imori, the person who almost got radiated, which neither of them seem to hold a grudge about, but he is pretty much the only important male protagonist by the end of the show. And despite killing a couple of people in season one for a somewhat justified reason, and being fucked over multiple times throughout the series, he is one of the few people by the end that I can still get behind. Because despite doing some bad things and being primarily for himself, he inevitably makes up for it and becomes one of the show's more justifiable characters in the end. Not to say none of the female characters do it too, like Raven and Octavia, but one of them had a plot that was so cliche and stupid you can't get into it, and the other committed acts so heinous it's kinda hard to forgive. Like forcing cannibalism. Yeah, that happened. So to properly get an idea of what this show tried to justify when the ideas ran out, let's analyze the seventh and final season of The Hundred. When everything went to shit. We open with Bellamy, unpleased about the events of the previous season, being her sister Octavia getting stabbed and disappearing. But this is mainly an excuse for him to get knocked out and dragged away by the invisible enemy. Because, unfortunately, behind the scenes, there are some race issues, and long story short, he's not in most of the season. And that's a problem, because he was kind of important, and without him, we're left putting way more emphasis on Clark, who's not gonna be represented well in this season. Anyway, the one who stabbed Octavia is Hope, and apparently she's good and has a note that says, Trust Bellamy. We also have Echo, Bellamy's lover, who is a terrible person, as we'll see. And Gabriel, who I personally like a great deal, but as you know, he's a man. Meaning he'll do the least. Kind of like a standby. They go on the anomaly after Bellamy, meaning most of what they do is going to be time travel theme. Like I said, when ideas run out. 
Back on Sanctum, the planet that the show takes place on, the important female characters discuss the abundance of lies they've told, which, like I said, can't be explained now, but the important thing is that Maddie, Clark's surrogate daughter, is still being made to pretend she's commander of one crew. Which is one of the factions living on Sanctum, and yes, I did say surrogate daughter. If you've played The Last of Us Part 2, you'll know why this ends badly. But things aren't going too well, as one of the other factions still believes in Russell, the villain of the previous season, and another faction wants him dead along with all his believers. But that's okay, because they... ask him to leave. Also, Raven, the aforementioned plot cliché, convinces Murphy, the important man token, and Murray to keep pretending they're Daniel and Kaylee to keep the peace. Also a previous season thing. And Clark, the amazing woman lead, goes to speak with Russell, the person who killed her mom in the previous season, which was tragic, promising it won't end in disaster. A few moments later... So the whole place burns down, the amazing woman lead refuses to let them put it out, cause I guess she has the right to do that. And this wouldn't be that disastrous of a situation, but in the process, Shade Hedda, the other villain of the previous season, kills Russell, and takes over his body. Which is once again a thing in this show. And as you'd probably guessed, amazing woman lead, not knowing what happened, just can't justify leaving him there to such an inhumane fate, and pulls him out only to sentence him to the same inhumane fate. Which we all know won't happen, because if it did, there'd be no main villain left. But this opening episode does kinda sum up what this show's about. As seen here, as she not only allows the main antagonist to obtain a host, but also heavily increases the conflict all because she got mad. It really is The Last of Us Part 2. The only difference here is that she apologizes and admits she might have been wrong. The problem is, this is just the beginning. Also, time travel, cause why not? This is explored in the next episode, as we see what happened to Octavia during the events of the previous season, when she disappeared and came back no longer the main villain. Which doesn't matter, she'll always be a dictator to me. She comes across Dioza, another character who ended up there, who is pregnant. But due to the time travel element stuff, the pregnancy is just about to take place. Isn't that convenient? She's obviously Hope, if you don't know by now, and after living happily for a while, she finds a helmet she can use to get back home. This means she'd have to leave them, but I think wanting to go back home to her own family would be perfectly justified. But Dioza feels different and destroys the helmet. Obviously another extremely selfish act, but you gotta understand, she's a strong woman who can fight. She's fucking cool, and she's a mom. No rules here. She didn't even have to apologize, all's forgiven. I'm not kidding, it really is. They get captured by the Disciples, the show's true main villains, leaving Hope all alone. The other three end up in the same area about a hundred years later, and learn that Bellamy isn't there. He's likely in Bardo, with the aforementioned Disciples. Their leader, Sanders, being the one who ordered Hope to tag Octavia in exchange for getting her mom back. But it was just a locator tag, so no harm done. They find a crazy guy with a timer on his hand counting down, and after a bit of an altercation, they realize their only hope is to befriend him, have them train them, and plan an escape. Because he's being punished, and when the timer runs out in five years, they'll come for him. The only deal is, due to his loyalty, they must not kill anyone, and cut their hair. I'm just kidding, I guess David Cage wrote this part. He has a thing for that. Also, when you think about it, in the David Cage game, you were neither someone who could do no wrong, or a complete asshole. Meaning Echo would actually fit in quite well. As for the whole not killing anyone thing, that falls apart pretty quickly. So instead, David Cage hybrid insists upon killing everybody just to be safe, and leaving him there to be alone for years to come, cause he might seek revenge. This is fucking sick! Ah, uh, what a great character. You do realize you have to kill the first person, right? This may have been unnecessary. Standby Man wasn't for it, but what does he know? He's just a stupid man. Back on Sanctum, a couple of assholes accidentally cause a nuclear meltdown, and the show does the best it can to make you hate the women. 
You see, one crew is not going to help fix the problem because they're wise to the whole flame deal, and Amazing Woman Lead is not going to let Maddie pretend she's still commander. You do realize nuclear meltdown means everyone dies, right? So the only option is to recruit the Aegeus prisoners in return for... All the Joe juice that we can drink. And since this show doesn't have enough cliché nonsense, the whole thing has to go completely wrong, forcing plot cliché to sacrifice the prisoners. Which is oddly enough a rare moment of this show being relatable. Yeah, it was wrong, but at least it's something that somebody might do in the same situation. And unlike the other deeds this show tries to justify, they at least point out that this was wrong and the character at hand actually feels bad. Which, believe me, won't happen again. And that's about the only good thing to say about this, as the whole matter has a very predictable outcome. Spoiler! Neither of these two kill each other. Also in this episode, Shade Hedda manages to avoid execution by becoming a martyr. Yeah, apparently when he said he wanted to burn to death after begging not to burn to death was a bit of a lie. It's made obvious by the fact that this guy clearly didn't do this spontaneously. That's kind of another problem with this season, it's occasionally badly written. Like in this moment, when we see that Hope was trained by this guy who arrived on penance after she was left alone, and during the escape he doesn't make it. Okay, we just met Hope in this season. We met this guy in this episode. It doesn't matter how long they knew each other, or how much sad music plays, this is not a sad moment. When are shows gonna stop doing this shit? It's cheap and lazy. The disciples finally show up on Sanctum, none too pleased about that guy committing suicide, that David Cage hybrid insisted they leave to rot, but they easily dispose of them and use the handy anomaly stone to go there themselves. The only problem is they don't know which planet it is, so they pick one at random and hope for the best. It's not the best. We get to see how Dictator escaped from Bardo, the first time, with the help of a new character, Levitt. Extremely nice guy who's gonna be good by the episode's end. And her obvious new love interest. Wait a minute. She's already had two lovers. <laughs> And he's a nice man. It's just not a fair deal. Hope shows up, clearly over her tragic loss. And if you're wondering why she's not nicer at the end of the last season after returning, it's because the only way to keep her memory is with the helmet, but Hope needs it to rescue her mom, so instead the third lover implants the coat on her back using his bullshit stick, so she can eventually piece it together. Isn't that convenient? And then there's this. Hey, we meet again. Like go float yourself, this is said about every chance they get. And I mean every chance. Back on Sanctum, the children of Gabriel start burning themselves alive in protest. And when they start lining up children, because... Of course, if it serves the glory and the grace of the bride. It doesn't. Okay. Important man token actually does something about it. Which is lame. I mean, doesn't he know that could have consequences that could affect him? He doesn't even know that kid. Besides, a cold demeanor and selfishness equals character development. What a loser. He gets caught lying and is sentenced to death, so they release Shade Hedda in which he tells them that he is Daniel and they better accept it. Even though he clearly isn't. In the process of this, Indra finds out he's not actually Russell and has his mind drive removed. They still can't kill him, but at least he can't resurrect. David Cage Hybrid, Background Man, and Hope finally rescue Dictator and get this. Bellamy dies. By that I mean, they actually expect you to believe that he's dead. Even though that looks nothing like an explosion. More like a portal of some sort. I guess they really think the audience is stupid. And if for some reason you don't really hate David Cage hybrid yet, she kills a guy who really had nothing to do with it, even though they needed him to find Hope's mother. But you gotta understand, there was a time when women weren't even taken seriously. We need scenes like this to remind us to never forget that. Even if it makes no sense. Oh, and Dioza escapes too. 
that's not original. Back on Sanctum, guns have gone missing, which is problematic, and Nelson, the guy who really wants Russell dead, is allowed into his cell without being checked. Because... Maybe because they think I'm satisfied you can't resurrect. So, somebody actually wrote this. After a bit of altercation, he reveals he's not Shade Hedda and gets them to team up with the prisoners to get the justice they deserve. Hmm, I wonder if that's gonna account for the missing guns. There's a completely pointless scene when Maddie agrees to become commander again, only to immediately change her mind. So, important man token convinces Indra to do it because she's the only one who can. Dioza finally reunites with Hope after almost killing her, leading to another scene that makes no fucking sense. Third Lover tells them the only way out is through the oxygen farm. But then a random guy says they can't go without rebreathers. Now, this may sound reasonable, obviously somebody's lying, right? No. We'll have to wait a bit for the reasoning, but you won't believe the excuse they have for this. So David Cage Hybrid kills her because they accidentally used Third Lover's name, and they want to go in anyway. Standby Man puts a stop to this, once again making the only man the sensible one, and they get captured. In a weird scene, Standby Man appears to have joined them after hearing about Transcendence and the Last War and promising not to be killed, but in actuality, he just agreed to assist them. Yet he does put the robe on. Do I get a robe? On Sanctum, Important Man Token is not too keen on a ceremony to reunite the children of Gabriel, and he's right, because Shade Hedda, who he now knows is not Russell, outright tells him something bad's gonna happen. But instead of telling somebody about it, he agrees to play chess in return for the information. I never said he was perfect. So this goes badly, not as bad as Nelson's dad literally trying to kill him because... reasons. Isn't that convenient? I guess if it hadn't happened, he might not help the Aegeus prisoners, so yeah. But that doesn't excuse this poor example of negotiation. First we make demands, and then we get to kill people. No, first you agree not to kill people, then you make demands, then you lie about not killing people. Not that complicated. We gotta put that riveting plot on hold for a bit because Amazing Woman Lead and the gang have finally arrived on Bardo, after a horror-themed episode, to learn that Bellamy is gone. He was killed off-screen by an oddly colored explosion that's a lot like those anomaly things we keep seeing, but still, he's gone. And that's that. So they wake up the true antagonist of the season, Bill. And there's a whole episode devoted to his backstory, which is also a backdoor pilot to a prequel series that's in development that I have little faith in. But to keep it simple, Bill's daughter Calliope abandoned him because he's stupid. They want the flame, and Amazing Woman Leeds says Calliope's mind has survived. But she's not too keen on helping due to Bellamy's death, and wants to see her friends, in which they've apparently been brainwashed. So why not question Standby Man? He's got a robe on. Well, we gotta see how that happens, so let's cut three months back and get a bit more of the plot explained. Let me get this straight. The ten foot aliens with superior technology that built this place got genocided and turned to stone by the enemy. We're gonna fight. Precisely. Okay. On to more interesting stuff, remember how the third lover sent them to that poison area? Well, apparently it's survivable for a few hours, and he needed to figure something out. And they believe this, because... If he was trying to kill us, he would have found easier ways to do it. A poisonous room you agreed to walk into. It's pretty fucking easy. Yeah, I know he's not lying, but isn't he supposed to be intelligent? That's not what this is. So they teach them their cause, and everybody seems to believe it aside from Hope. She then fails a test, implicating she'd be okay with children burning up, because they deserve it. This is fucking sick. And she's sentenced to five years on penance. They're obviously faking it. Let's get back to the interesting plot. Like the hostage situation on Sanctum, in which they demand Daniel, Russell, and plot cliche. 
They get Shade Headed to help them in return for the stuff he clearly wouldn't have done this for, and apart from having to reveal their identities to stall them, it goes pretty well. And because they now know his identity, they figure fuck it, just lock him in the room and they'll kill him. Instead, he kills them, and only important man token notices multiple people screaming. I can play Jewish daughter. Still, this plan doesn't add up. How's this gonna help him escape? It's not like he's gonna sneak out right in front of them without them noticing. He escaped through the secret passage. We need to find him before he can reach one crew. So he makes his way to the palace to broadcast his identity to everyone, meaning the only option now is single combat. With new hairstyles. For the sake of the plot, Indra doesn't do too well, but women don't die too often on this show, so Maddie jumps in to finish him off or blind him in one eye, resulting in him being appropriately pissed off. He still wins, but in the process, Maddie escapes. Are these people fucking blind? On Bardo, they come to the conclusion that the three haven't really joined, because if they did, they would have told them that the flame is no longer an amazing woman leads head. No shit. They eventually all meet up, but there's just one problem. David Cage Hybrid wants revenge and plans to set off the Gem 9 bioweapon. And fuck the consequences. Because you gotta remember. There was a time when women didn't get important roles in movies, and killing a bunch of women and children is a big step up. And if you don't agree, well, you're a fucking sexist. Oh, and that whole last war thing? Apparently it's about not using violence. Is that supposed to be a twist? They talk David Cage hybrid out of her justifiable deed, but Anders is none too pleased about them killing three people and torturing one, so Hope kills him, and for some reason she tries to do the exact same thing, because... I... I don't know. This results in Dioza's death, and the only thing that I can take from this is women suck? That's gotta be the message. But you're never gonna see this coming. Bellamy isn't dead. He was teleported to a random planet along with his new friend Doshiewicz. They spend a decent amount of time there, and after finally agreeing to pray with him, the storm that's incidentally keeping them there stops. This is impounded by the fact that the only way out is with a leap of faith. Get it? Leap of faith? Terribly ingenious. Highly imaginative, incredibly inventive. So Bellamy tells them Amazing Woman Lee doesn't have the flame, proving he's now one of them. Meaning, for the third time in this show, Bellamy is essentially bad. I mean, he's not like Morgan from The Walking Dead who changes personality every season, but it's still lazy writing. I guess they're not good at making men into complete assholes, so they give them some justification, unlike others, but in the end, it's a big letdown. It obviously has to do with him not being in most of the season, but they would have been better off just having him die in the first episode, opposed to all this cliche bullshit. So, Shade Hedda kills everyone who won't kneel, including Nelson, if you care, and he has himself an anomaly stone. He tracks down Important Man Token and the people he has hidden, but he can't get inside as Amori threatens to blow the reactor. So, he takes Important Man Token captive. Get it? Because they're like, chess pieces? <laughs> ah. Bill's not happy about no progress, and since they all hate Bellamy now, they're not helping him fix it. So it's brain scan time, which fails, so it's threatened to send people to penance time. This gets her to agree, so long as her friends are released. But instead of sending them all to Sanctum, he sends most of them somewhere else, in case she's less than truthful. What the hell happened here? That's just what I was thinking. Uh, about the show. Surprisingly, they manage to subdue Shade Hedda pretty easily, and the Red Sun hits, something from the previous season, causing Standby Man to hallucinate. Through a series of elaborate events and cliches, they knock out the power, letting in the infected bugs, solving both their problems. They manage to get inside, it's a good thing nobody was standing there, and Amazing Woman Lead finally gives in the flame. We, of course, have a scene when Nikki almost kills plot cliché, in which she says she wants to die because of guilt, and she doesn't kill her because that would be too easy, and I'm not making this up. 
Standby Man helps fix the flame because of the illusion, but then decides he can't go through with it and shoots it. I guess he was tired of standing by. This results in Amazing Woman lead killing Doshuit, which didn't seem needed, and they make Bill enter the code to the only available planet. There's just one problem. Maddie's sketchbook, containing evidence that she still has the commander's memories. And Bellamy says he must keep it safe, but that could result in Maddie being in danger, so she kills him. For real this time, he ain't coming back, he's fucking dead. And since she ran out of bullets, cause most guns aren't infinite, she still loses the book and accomplishes nothing. And this is about the worst way you could kill off an important character. The whole concept of him turning bad and being killed for literally no reason is as lazy as you can get when you truly run out of ideas. This may be an infuriating moment, but not as infuriating as the reaction to it. But first, I should mention that they end up back on Earth, Bill teleports away using his nano thing, and they have one of those helmets because Gaia, who ended up there sooner, managed to obtain it. Now, back to the reaction. They don't get that mad. They just say it's his fault, his beliefs caused it, and she shouldn't feel bad. They don't mention irrelevant things like how she doesn't have the book, they just have a nice moment in which everything is good. That being David Cage hybrid, who's done multiple inhumane things throughout this season alone, the dictator who once killed people for not eating other people and caused multiple deaths, and the amazing woman lead, who has again done many, many bad things like betraying her friends in season 5. They made their choice apologizing for it, and then did more bad things, like burning down the palace that wasn't hers, apologized again, and, uh, yeah. But, strong woman. This is obviously one of the most bullshit moments in the whole series, and it's topped only, and I mean only, by the next scene. Hey, what the hell are you doing? That's the only way out of here. Earth is our home. Everyone who is from here, is here. Everyone we care about. I will not lose anyone else. Now, in case you're wondering, they make it obvious that staying on Earth is bad for almost everybody. The people of Sanctum need them, Gabriel wants to save his people, and there's no hot water. But Amazing Woman Lead says no because she doesn't care about that stuff. Remember in Season 2 when she actually had a difficult choice to make, and in the end she had to sacrifice the people of Mount Weather? That was actually justified because it wasn't only about what she wanted. A lot of innocent people would have died either way, resulting in one of those moments when you have to ask the ultimate question. What would you do? It's an impactful scene that made Season 2 a fan favorite season. This isn't. It's overall selfish, and the way she tries to justify it makes it all the more maddening. And yes, most of them are just fine with it. Apart from Maddie, she actually calls her out on her bullshit, and it's one of the best scenes. You ruined my life. Just like you ruined your own. <laughs> you know who else isn't okay with it? Important man token who actually gives a shit about people, and devises a plan to fix the helmet and find the stone. Then we have what may be an even better scene. I'm sorry, Murphy. You were right. We need to leave. Why? What happened? Yes, I can hear the feminists crying their eyes out. It's truly amazing. This mind change comes as Shadehetta showed up and made a deal that if he gets to keep Sanctum, he'll bring them Maddie. Unfortunately, Standby Man was in the wrong place at the wrong time. I guess he's done standing by. But I guess sending someone to bring someone back who doesn't believe in the cause and doesn't like the person they're supposed to bring back is a bad idea. Standby man, not dead yet, helps her escape, and he gets into a fight he apparently can't win and retreats, leaving his helmet behind. It's too bad they had to wait for the helmet because then standby man wouldn't have died, but we don't judge Amazing Woman lead. Maddie teleports away using the same risk-free method so nobody else gets hurt. Then a bomb goes off. That's gonna shake things up. Important man token's fine because nobody can kill him, but... She was right in front of me! She was right... She was right there! Yes, but now there's a pile of rocks in front of you. Which is incidentally right there. Then again, if not for Amazing Woman lead, this wouldn't have happened, so he kinda has a reason to be upset. 
They find her not in the best condition, and Amazing Woman Lead has apparently learned nothing. Nonsense. All that matters now is saving Maddie and killing Kat again. There's no last war or test. Bellamy's dead because he believed that crap, and I've heard enough. No, he's dead because you shot him. For no reason. Things aren't going too well for Maddie right now, as they're free to dig through her brain to find the code. And Third Lover has an ingenious plan to tell someone that the Shepherd wants the nanotags from Earth brought over. And despite knowing he didn't originally want this, she does it anyway. He literally got demoted to a janitor, yet she believes him anyway. Are you satisfied? This is handy because they recently attempted to use the tags to no avail because somebody has to pull them through. The problem is the bridge has been moved, so they're fucked. But that's okay because Third Lover breaks them out. And they devise another genius plan to release Shade Hedda to create a distraction. You could argue they knew it wasn't a perfect plan, but they look legitimately surprised when he's not there. Meanwhile, Important Man Token, Plot Cliché, and the Doctor finally locate the stone and make it back. That's all I personally care about, but I probably should mention that Maddie is now brain dead. All that digging had a negative effect, and no, they don't mention the Amazing Woman lead caused it. In a confusing scene, they opt to do the humane thing and kill her, but after learning Bill actually got the code, they decide to kill him first. So they leave her there. But what if they don't make it back? To be continued? Yeah, that's pretty obvious. Why does just this episode have it? Imori seems to be okay, so plot cliché leaves to help. Which you can bet is gonna be in a cliché manner. The amazing woman lead gets an amazing badass moment, that's gonna win me over, but it turns out this is actually some kind of test. That's not really Calliope, it's just who he wants to see. But that's okay, because he's ready to take that test. Damn it! I hate when fatalities begin with the opponent dying. It's pointless. Here's a shocking moment. Who would see this coming? I'm not surprised they made up, but when did they make up? Very little time has passed between these events. Aren't any of these people still mad? Even The Walking Dead knows you can't do this. You may have reached the assumption I don't like The Walking Dead. They use energy weapons to hold off the Disciples in a peaceful manner, and in a surprising twist, Amori actually dies. And it's kind of sad, which is at this point uncommon. So, Important Man Token puts her mind drive in his head, even though it'll mean his death, just to see her again. Which is lame, I mean, there's no innocent casualties in that. Man, men suck. Unlike Amazing Woman Lead, who may have fucked up humanity because killing people during the test is prohibited, but that's okay because remember, it wasn't revenge, it was justice. In all seriousness, not only does she commit her final act of, uh... Just a general sense of selfishness. But she spends the rest of the episode doing nothing. I guess she's entitled? And if for some reason you're thinking she wouldn't have done it if she knew what would happen, that theory will be debunked by the end. So, plot cliché has to take the test instead and prove there's goodness in the world. But Shade Hedda puts a stop to that. Nonsense. History is written by the victors. Let's try this again. Did I mention he's a great villain? This results in multiple people getting shot. I don't know how she isn't. But since one of them is David Cage hybrid, I ain't complaining. No, it was just getting good. A dictator gives a speech about violence being bad, and at this point, I thought if one thing is certain, a happy ending is not deserved. Most of the characters are beyond indecent, and the ones that aren't don't really do much. So if it ended on a depressing note with them not laying down their weapons, and humanity just dying out, that would kind of justify everything that's happened, and... For all mankind. Or not. I guess no consequences and happy ending. Everybody transcends, including mind drives, except for Amazing Woman Lead. Since she broke the rules, she can't transcend, meaning the show has one last chance to do something right and prove consequences do exist. There she is!
So even though they just confirmed the fact that she's not sorry, stating she would do it again, everyone chooses not to transcend, so she won't be alone. Apart from Maddie, which I'm happy about, but still, what the fuck is this? This is one of the most in-your-face fuck-you endings I've seen in some time. A show that used to be about hard decisions, and the concept of consequence reduced to this. A bullshit cop-out when everything works out just because happy ending. Oh, and the only reason Maddie chose not to transcend is because she assumed she wouldn't want her there with no friends. So even she copped out. A curious species indeed. Fuck off. Your character dying in season 3 was the least of this show's problems. Why does nobody complain about this season? So that's The 100, season 7, and it's fucked up. I think in a way, the show feels like its 7th season came out exactly when it did. By that, I mean it went from a show with a pretty decent female lead and turned into a product of its time, in which the lead just does terrible things and tries to pass it off as a hard decision. They used to do a pretty good job justifying it to a point while not saying it's okay, but eventually the apologies got kind of old and the action stopped being justified. Now, this could have been a result of the show just running out of ideas, but if that's the case, it shouldn't have had a happy ending. And maybe, maybe you could justify killing Bellamy. Maybe. Cause she clearly didn't want to, and I thought having him die was a bad idea aside from that. But then there's burning down the palace, jump-starting the season's conflict, breaking the helmet leading to more death, and almost dooming humanity and saying she'd do it again. Yeah, she's done bad things in other seasons too that weren't justified, but those were few and far between. This isn't. And when you consider what the other characters have done and not regretted, opposed to the only important man doing good things like keeping children from being burned alive and eventually making the ultimate sacrifice, it seems somewhat intentional. Important Man Token has not outright killed anybody since he was bad in Season 1, and even that was kind of justified. While Amazing Woman Lead kills multiple people for no reason, mainly because it looks cool. Throw in the fact that the season is plain badly written, infested with moments of pure stupidity, and there's very little to like about this. It's not a bad show overall, but I don't know if I could recommend something that ends the way this does. Everything the show used to be is discarded and replaced with bullshit and shock value. It may not be good for enjoyment, but it is a good lesson in the danger of feminism in the entertainment industry. And that's about it. I'm The Analyst, and remember kids, consequence is more of a man thing. Doing great though. He's a happy kid. I um, took a page from Clark's parenting book. He knows all about you guys. Believe it or not, Murphy's his favorite. It was in rebellious phase. Tell me about this John Murphy. Is he family? Friend? Lover? I was his favorite though. Wasn't I, Jordan?